Well, I know that a horse's bridle, you know, if they're just standing, it's probably about a meter and a half or so off the ground. Okay, so it's like four and a half or five feet off the ground. You know, a full-size horse, generally. And so they had a lot of blood. Okay, so like without the city and blood was shed. Like Jesus, without the city and blood was shed. Well, he only had the blood of one human. Well, these people have the blood that actually fills up enough to the horse's bridles. All that blood will not take away their sin. But even a drop of Christ's blood, just that little bit that was spilled in his death. And I know there was more than a drop. I get it. But just what was shed from his one body was enough to cleanse everyone who's willing to be forgiven of their sin. So you can spill your own blood if you want to, but it's not going to save you. If you partake of the blood that Christ has offered for you, well, really, it's the Lamb of God. So it's really the blood that God has offered for you. If you're willing to receive of that blood, you can be forgiven even today. So the idea of today is to look at chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. Now, I must say I'm not going to cover it in detail because just recently, it wasn't very long ago, I let out a a series of 20 presentations on the three angels' messages itself. I don't think I want to spend a whole presentation just on the first few verses or the last few verses of this chapter. So I'm going to try to cover it all really quickly. And we can refer you to the 21 presentations on the book of Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12. There is so much to understand there. Looking at the words and the phrases and finding them in other sections of the Bible helps us to understand what is and also what isn't being said in the three angels' messages. And so, um, yeah, I think we'll have a good time today. But just so you know, there's plenty more to look at in the uh, Bible compared to just going over it once or twice. I mean, you we really have to dig. We need to try to find out what it is the Bible is saying. We just prayed together, and we're going to move in now to Revelation 14 and try to look at what's happening with these uh, people that are standing there on Mount Sion. Now, before we go, I'd like to say we're in the midst of the fourth time the book of Revelation goes from the time of Christ on the earth until the second coming of Christ on the earth. What do I mean? Well, if you're not familiar with the layout of the book of Revelation, the first three major sevens, I will say major because there's lots of sevens, but the three major sevens are the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. That takes you through the first half of the book of Revelation. You just, in that phrase, uh, the seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, you just went from chapter one to the end of chapter 11. Okay, that's the first half of the book of Revelation. Now, what happens is you go from the time of Christ till the second coming of Christ in the churches, you do it in the seals, and you do it in the trumpets as well. Now, from the time of chapter 12, you see that Christ is in the belly of the woman. That's when he was going to be brought forth as a man, a son of man, from the Virgin Mary, right? So that's when he was on the earth. And up until chapter 16 at the end, really, it's actually chapter 19, if you want to really get into specifics, but... It's chapter 16 at the end where you have um, Christ there in the belly of the woman. And then finally, during the seven last plagues, the very next thing that happens is Christ comes, right? So you have this situation where we're in the middle of the fourth time the book of Revelation goes from the time of Christ till the second coming of Christ. The churches, the seals, the trumpets, and then chapter 12 through 16. So we're in chapter 14 now, right in the middle of it. Now what's fascinating about this is chapter 14 holds the three angels' messages. And now we know there's already at the end of chapter 8 of the book of Revelation, which is in the midst of the seven trumpets, we know that there's their false gospel that goes to the world. There's the three woes. Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, right? For the voice of the three angels, which have these trumpets, are about to sound. Well, we know that the false gospel comes through those next three trumpets. And it's Christ finally that destroys everything in the final trumpet. And that's where he's able to have victory over all things. Of course, we, I concluded, I don't know if you agree, but I concluded that that was after the close of probation, which is at the end of chapter 11. And so you have this, this idea of 
three angels proclaiming the messages of the false God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, That's chapters 12 and 13, because there's the first beast of 13 and the second beast of 13. There's the beast and the false prophet. So you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Those three have three angels, and those three angels are found at the end of chapter 8. Well, the true Father, the true Son, and the true Spirit, you know, the, fa- the Spirit of the Father through the Son, that truth actually has three angels as well. And that's what we're going to read about in chapter 14. So you have this battle going on in the book of Revelation over souls of men. It's you and it's me. So we're in the midst of this battle. We're in the midst of the, the, the book of Revelation that's going from the time of Christ to the second coming. Time of Christ, second coming. Time of Christ, second coming time of Christ, we're in the middle of this next one until the second coming, you see? So there's a thousand things going on in the book of Revelation, but we're here in the middle trying to understand what are the three angels that's so important to let people know about? What do they say and what do they don't say, okay? So we're going to look a little bit about that as we skim through the three angels because we already have, like I said, 21 messages on this subject. And I, you know, went over and over and over again, the concepts that are there. And I'm sure if I did it again, I would learn a thousand things that I've never even thought of again. I mean, more. And, and just it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So the more we study, the more God reveals to us, especially if it's transformative to the character and allows us to be able to share with others more about the truth that God is trying to proclaim to the world. That's what I'm trying to do. I want my life to be changed into the glory of God's character. I want to be able to have the mind of Christ that was in him, which was the mind of the Father. And I also want to be able to have the opportunity to share the truths that God has given to us through his word. So it's like I'm part of this ministry that God has, the Father through his Son, through the ministration of the angels, through the prophets, through you and through me, and through us to anybody else who's willing to listen. Okay? So I'm going to share now real quick, what it is that Revelation 14 says. I looked, now this was immediately after the wisdom, the false wisdom, because you know Christ is wisdom, but here we have the false wisdom, and there's 666. The true wisdom is different. That's Christ, and that makes up all the sevens, which are completeness. You are complete in him. Now, I looked, and lo, so the word look, you know, I looked, and then he's saying, now you look. So I looked, and now you look a lamb. Now we know 21, I'm sorry, 29 times the book of Revelation uses the word lamb. Every time but one, which was in chapter 13, it refers to Jesus Christ. So lo, look, there was a lamb and this lamb stood. He stood on Mount Sion. Now we know, I know, you know, that the word lamb is symbolic, right? Say it with me, symbolic. Say it one more time, symbolic. And it stood on Mount Sion. Now, we know that a mountain can be symbolic as well as a government. Now, there is really a Mount Sion. It's in heaven. I believe that it's actually there. We're going to be able to put our feet on it someday in the future. But here, it very well could be symbolic. Just as the lamb was symbolic, the mountain or the government of God could be symbolic as well. And with him are 144,000. Now, wait a minute. Is that literal in the midst of a symbolic lamb sitting on the government of God? Uh, maybe, but I suggest it's not um, literal. Did I say literal before? Is this a literal number? I suggest this is a symbolic number, and I have a reason why. I've gone through plenty of times the uh, presentation, but if you're interested, I could show you online. There is a time where I take uh, an opportunity to show why I believe this is symbolic. Um, I'm not going to throw anybody off of Mount Sion if they believe that it's literal. I just don't think they have any support for it, except they'll say, wait a minute, Ellen White said that I heard the number. And yeah, right. She said it in the context of everything symbolic around her. There was a symbolic path and a symbolic light, and people were symbolically falling off the, the cliff into a symbolic world of darkness below. Are you telling me all that was literal? Tell me, where is this path? I want to get on it. You see, it's, it's not literal. It's symbolic. All of it. And then she heard the number. Yeah, right. The number is actually 144,000, but it actually refers to something symbolic, you see? So it is a number. It's a real number, 144,000. But so is the number 1260. It's an actual number. 
but it's to be understood symbolically, right? So, okay, I don't have to go further on this. It's just that some people really have a hard time seeing that this also can be symbolic. Well, anyways, with him, 144,000, having his father's name. Now, the father, there's no reason to believe this is symbolic. We don't have a reason to believe the father ever is symbolic in the Bible. But his name is, his name is symbolic of his character and his authority, and it's written on their foreheads. Now, their foreheads are symbolic as well because his name is not going to be a stamp on your forehead. And if you get a tattoo of the father's name on your forehead, I'm going to think you're probably going off the deep end. And you would think I'm doing the same thing. So, really, what we have is a symbolic lamb sitting on the symbolic mount with a name symbolic of the Father's character and symbolic foreheads, and then you have a literal 144,000 in the midst of that? I don't think so. Okay, I mean, if you want to take literal and figurative and just mix it up and and just put it where you want it, go for it. But I don't think it's responsible doing that in the Bible study that I will do and lead. Okay, so uh, I found that to be symbolic, and it fits in just perfectly. Anyways, the foreheads. Let's, let's look at this phrase for a second. I'm going to right-click and search for the word for heads, and it comes up eight times, eight specific times. You can see right there. But if I look up the word forehead and put an asterisk behind it, then it comes up 24 times. Now notice, it's once in Exodus. It is one, two, three times in Leviticus. It is once in Samuel, once in Chronicles, it is, uh, sorry, twice in Second Chronicles. It is in Jeremiah once. It is in Ezekiel one, two, three, four, four times in Ezekiel. And then notice in Revelation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight times in the book of Revelation. So what that means to me is that the concept of the forehead is most important when you're studying the book of Revelation. Revelation uses the word itself more than any other time in the Bible. Well, okay, more than any other book in the Bible. You have a couple here and a couple there and once here and once there. But the book of Revelation, eight times, is using the word forehead. It means that it's really important in the book of Revelation to understand what the forehead is. And what that means is, if you do your study, do it on your, on your own. The forehead is not like where you can actually touch right here. Yes, that's your forehead. But it's symbolic of the inner thoughts, the area of your mind where you make decisions, right? And if you choose to surrender your life to God with his law and his word as your foundation, then, hey, you've got the mind of God in you and you're, you're striving for that mind. If that's what you're praying for and you're studying for, you're looking for, you're, you're surrounding yourself with influences that will give you that direction, then God's got you on the right path. And God the Father, who has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of his Son, Jesus Christ. And so I believe that the forehead is very important to understand. It is our choices. And believe you me, righteousness is a choice, just like sin is a choice. We're not going to accidentally fall into heaven. Oops, that was my bad. Hey, God, good to see you. Now, that's just, it's, it's totally, uh, you, you don't think that way. I mean, I don't. You're not going to fall into hell either accidentally. Whoops, I didn't mean to be here. These are choices that we are going to make. God is not going to allow you easily to go to hell. Neither is the enemy easily can allow you to go to heaven. They are both warring for you. And there's a great controversy between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. You're in the midst of it. And you're going to choose which side you're going to be on. You're going to follow the influence of Satan and his angels. Or you're going to follow the influence of Christ and his angels. Which spirit that is in the agents are you going to follow, right? So I, I'm an agent of God or an ambassador, as the Bible says, and I have an influence. I have a spirit that you can partake of. You can accept like, wow, you know, I kind of like what he's saying. I like how he is and whatever. But what if I started teaching falsehood and lies and undermining other ministries and telling you that you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that because, you know, they, blah, blah. well, then you can start saying, now, wait a minute. I, that doesn't sound like the kind of spirit that would be in Christ. I'm not going to follow him, right? So you have a choice to make either to follow the light or follow the darkness. I do too. And so that's what the forehead's all about. We have the capabilities of making decisions. And God wants us to be skilled in making those decisions. He wants his character, his name in our thoughts, in our character, in our foreheads. 
and he wants us to reflect his glory to the world, right? So you could have, as the Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, I believe it's chapter three or maybe five. I don't remember which one, but it tells us that the woman that's supposed to be Jerusalem has a whore's forehead. A whore's forehead, really? Yes, that's the one time it uses that phrase in Jeremiah, the whore's forehead. Go look it up for yourself. And it's fascinating that God's people doesn't have his forehead, doesn't have his character in their forehead. He, the God's people, listen to what the Bible says, has the enemy's character in their forehead, the whore's forehead, kind of like Revelation chapter 17 with the harlot that has, you know, the Babylon mystery, the great on her forehead. That's what God's people are likened unto in the book of Jeremiah. And similarly in Ezekiel chapter 16, and similarly in chapter 1 of the book of Isaiah. So you have all these chapters in the Bible telling us that God's people have really messed up. And a major part of why they're called out like that is because they have committed what's known as idolatry. Idolatry is going against God in the first and second commandments. Those commandments, by the way, are up there at the top for a reason. The, the more I teach about the commandments, the more I believe that they're actually put in the most important first down through to the end. Like the last one is the least important. Don't, you know, want something for yourself. It just, you know, selfishness. And not, now we know that all selfishness leads to sin. It's sin. It's contrary to God, etc. But if you have God first, like in the first commandment, if you actually have him first in your life, everything else is going to fall into line, period. Now, if you have the Sabbath first, then not everything's going to fall into line. The reason being is because the Jews had that, right? But they didn't have the right God. And as a result, they crucified his son. So they had the right day, but the wrong God. And so, you, you know, you can't have that one first. And you can't have like, thou shalt not kill first, because, you know, people don't always kill, but they do have a wrong God. So if you have number one first, you're in. And that's what I think is probably the most important is the first commandment. And that's why God's people were so called out by the prophets is because they were idolaters. Here today, same thing. We have idolaters all around the world and they have a horse forehead. We don't want a horse forehead. We want what we want what the Bible says here in Revelation chapter 14. We want God's name in our forehead, right? Verse 2. I heard a voice from heaven. Okay, so this voice from heaven says something. It is as the voice of many people, many waters. And so like a big crowd. And as the voice of great thunder, we know that thunder represents the presence of God, and also the ministration of the angels, which ascend and descend like lightning, according to Ezekiel chapter 1. And so lightning comes with what? Thunder. And so the voice of many waters, many people, many voices, and great thunder, which follows lightning. And of course, the angels are many people, and they have great uh, lightning-like movements. And so this great voice from heaven was kind of like the voice of angels. That's what I'm just, that's what it says right there. I mean, that's what it means, okay? Well, could mean, I'll say that, because it, perhaps you have another meaning, but it certainly could mean what I just said. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. So there's singing up in heaven, right? And we know that the angels rejoice when one sinner comes to repentance. You can look that in, look up that in Luke chapter 15. There is joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And of course, the Lord, Ze um, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says, he will rejoice over you with singing, right? Hebrews talks about Christ singing in the churches as well. So anyways, there's lots of singing in heaven. Chapter 14, verse 3, they sung, as it were, a new song. This new song, kind of like chapter 5, people didn't sing this song yet. It was a new one before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And who was it that was singing? Well, no man could learn that song, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Wait a minute. In heaven, it was the 24 elders and the four living creatures that were singing the song. And it's interesting because they were singing. You can read about it over there, but no man could sing this song that the 144,000 were singing. That means it wasn't the elders and the 24 or the four living creatures. Interesting, right? Anyways, verse four. These are they which were not defiled with women. Now that's of course symbolic following this symbolic number. 
right? So they were not defiled with women. That does not mean that every single one of them had never had children before or had never, you know, uh, well, that basically that sums it up. They've never, of course, they're families. Families represent the character of God and the, the government of God. And so, yes, there was a man and a woman that were married with children that were part of this group, but it says they were never defiled with women, right? The women are the false churches. You can read about that in Isaiah chapter 4, Revelation 17, and you can find that there's all sorts of women that are false in the Bible. Well, they are virgins. What does that mean? Well, they haven't defiled themselves with any false doctrine that the false women are defiling the world with. Like, for example, remember the golden cup in the hand of the harlot of Revelation chapter 17? In that is the fornication that she committed with all the kings of the earth. And the unity between the kings of the earth and this church, you know, church and state, and the false doctrines that they were willing and ready to receive and go into this false deception that the woman of Revelation 17 had for them to drink, that's what is being described here. Uh, it's, except it's the contrary. These people, the 144,000, didn't partake of that harlot juice that she had in that cup. No, they were willing to only partake of that which was pure and holy, just and good. And I want to be one of those people. I want to be able to understand just what God wants me to have in this life here on this earth so that I can be ready to be taken by his son back to him. That's what I want. And I want you to want the same thing. That's why we're here together, right? So they are not defiled with women. They are virgins with that false doctrine that the false women have. These are they which follow this symbolic lamb whithersoever he goeth, anywhere he goes, whether it's to life or to death. They follow him with their shoulders back and their head held high. These were redeemed from among men. Kind of like it says in Revelation chapter 5. Hmm, interesting. Being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, the first fruits is symbolic. God is not symbolic. And the Lamb, though, he is symbolic. That's uh, symbolic of Jesus Christ, right? So these were redeemed from among men. And in their mouth was found no guile. Now, it's so interesting when you look at this word, it's a trick or bait, kind of like, you know, a fisherman. I will make you fishers of men. Well, guess what? That was said by Jesus, but the devil says the same thing. I will make you fishers of men. And what I'm going to put on you is guile. It's a decoy. It's something that will subtly bring you with craft, as it says in the Old Testament, with the, uh, what is that? The, uh, the exceeding great horn of Daniel chapter 8 with craft and deceit he's the one that does this well of course so no guiles in their mouth so they're contrary to the common teachings of the world they're not teaching the same thing that everybody else is because why this is why for they are without fault just like daniel just like joseph just like job they are without fault before the throne of god oh man i want to be there i want to be like that listen one of the first things that got me inspired as a non-Christian, like somebody who had just come into reading the Bible, I was reading the book of Psalms, and it said, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And I remember thinking, and it, and it could apply this way, though I, I understand further now that it's the righteousness of Christ, but at that time I, I recognized, like, I can worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness? Like, I can be holy and worship the Lord that way? That was really inspiring to me. I, I actually wanted, that was 25 years ago, I wanted to be holy. I wanted to be one of those that could worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And it was, it's been inspiring ever since. I want to be holy. Now, sure, I've been caught up in sins through the 25 years. I know I've done things purposely that have been wrong. Yes, I get it. But God doesn't have to leave us like that. You know, you, well, how does that go? Um, I didn't want to fall, but I don't have to crawl, right? You, you can stand up and God can wipe you off and you can continue walking with him. As it says in Psalm, I think it's either 34 or 37. I don't remember. But, you know, when you're walking and you go to stumble, he can uphold you with his right hand. And you don't stumble in that path that he's called you on. You can walk without falling, without stumbling, without uh, sullying the garments that God has given you. You don't have to make everything dirty. You can be upheld by the power of God. And that's what we have here in this description of the 144,000. They are without fault before the throne of judgment. 
that God sits on. Okay, that's really inspiring to me. Well, I saw another angel, and he's flying quickly in the midst of heaven. He has the everlasting gospel, which he's going to preach to everyone that dwells in the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That includes you. And if you know that gospel, then you're actually part of the ministry that this angel has in being able to proclaim this gospel. So like if you want to co-work with the angels, this is one of the angels to co-work with. Co-work with this angel that has the everlasting gospel to preach. So, you know, God doesn't really want to use angels to preach, though he will. There are angels that are sent to people to actually preach to them the truth. But, so it, it works that way. But he would rather have you be the mouth to speak and co-work with the angels, to be able to proclaim that which God has for them to learn. Saying with a loud voice, this is megaphone, megaphone, okay, megaphone. So saying with a loud voice, fear God. Now, it doesn't say gods with a plural. It doesn't say fear gods. Fear God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. It does not say that. It says fear God. And who is this God that we're to fear? That is God the Father. And God the Father is to receive glory. Okay, All glory goes to the Father, even in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 describes that we are not to be, you know, thinking ourselves more above the others around us. We're to be humble. We're to be meek, like Jesus was when he came to this earth. He was the Lord of glory, brought forth from the Father, and he was in the likeness, in the morphe of God the Father. But when he became a human, he was in the likeness of a servant, in the forme, or the morphe, rather, of a servant. So in the morphe of God, in the morphe of a servant. So he was brought forth from God. He was brought forth from a woman as well. So he was begotten from both. And what you have is that this Jesus was given a name exalted above every other name. And that every knee should bow and confess that he is Lord to the glory of who? God the Father. And so when it says here, worship him, worship God, fear God, and give glory to him, that glory is ultimately going to go to him at the very end when we all worship Jesus Christ anyway. So when we worship Jesus, what's going to happen? He's going to have everybody focusing on him and he's going to point everybody to God the Father. <laughs> I like that. You know, I didn't even know God the Father when I was a preacher in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I had just, I, I had no clue about who God was and what he meant. He was just kind of behind Jesus because Jesus was the God of the Bible to me. And so, uh, yeah, he was there, but he, he wasn't definitely not as important as Jesus. Although they were, you know, co-equal, co-eternal, it was, I didn't understand it. But now I understand there is God the Father, and God the Father has a son. And that son he is exalted to be equal with himself. And so, yes, I get it. They're both equal. But there is God who has brought forth the son. And you get into all those details, and I don't want to explain it again because I've gone over it so many times. But the point is, fear God. That's the Father. Fear God and give glory to him, the ultimate him that will receive the glory at the end of all things. Fear God and give glory to him for because the hour of his judgment is come. And you'd be like, wait a minute, John chapter 5 says Jesus is the judge of all. Yes, because God the Father has given judgment unto his son because he is the son of man. Look it up for yourself. So the reason why Jesus is the judge is because God the Father gave it to him. So ultimately, God the Father is the judge. And worship him, that's God the Father, that made heaven. Wait a minute, I thought Jesus made everything. Well, yeah, he did because God enabled him to make everything. So God created all things through his Son. So really, it's worship God the Father who created all things through his Son, making heaven, earth, sea, and all the fountains of waters. That's direct quote from the Sabbath commandment of Exodus chapter 20. And so really, this is dealing with God the Father. That is the first angel's message. Now, there followed another angel, another message, and we are to be proclaiming this message as well, saying, Babylon, you know that woman of Revelation 17, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, she started, of course, fallen the first time in 1798. And I believe, personally, the next time she has fallen, which there is twice here, and it is for emphasis, but it is twice, she fell in 1798 symbolically, and she fell again symbolically in 1980. 1980, friends, 42 years ago. Don't be fooled. 1980 was a very important year for Seventh-day Adventists. They chose another god. That great city. Wait a minute, I thought Zion was supposed to be the mountain upon which the great city is sitting on. Jerusalem. Oh, no. 
Babylon is sitting on seven mountains, just like Jerusalem is on seven mountains as well. If you didn't know that, you should study. Babylon's on seven mountains. Jerusalem is on seven mountains. Jerusalem is called in the book of Revelation, the great city. So is Babylon. They're both called the same thing. They both have foundations. They both have gold. They're both women. They're both in the wilderness. They both have light. They both have glory. They both have pearls, gems, jewels. They both have all sorts of stuff. Okay, they, they're similar. And the reason why is because if you're deceived and you're in Babylon, you're looking around at the woman and you've got the title there, you've got the gold, you've got the glory, you've got the foundations, you've got the wilderness outside, everything looks good. You're like, wow, there, there's gates and everything. It just, you've got seven mountains. This is great. I feel at home. But you haven't studied your Bible to find out whether or not you're in the real great city. Because if you are in a great city and it looks the same, then you've got problems because there is another great city that actually has a title and it's gold and it's got foundations and there's wilderness outside and it's a woman and it, it's got, you know, the, the pearls and the, the, all that stuff, the gold. Well, yeah, they're both very similar. You can find it right in the book of Revelation. But the problem is one is true and one is false. And we're calling people out of that which is false into that which is true. This is the message going around the world right now. Come out of her, my people. And listen, if you're studying the Sabbath school lesson and it's not teaching things that are right, come out of her, my people. It doesn't say wait till you're kicked out. You speak until you, you know, until somebody knows something and then come out. That's what I believe we should do. Come out of her. Now, in my case, I was kicked out. But by this time, if I wasn't kicked out, I would come out. And so, uh, you know, that's just, I would say, get out of her, my people. Go away from that which is false and learn and study and know that which is true and live it. Amen? So that's what I think is important today. Anyways, Babylon has fallen, has fallen twice. 1798, 1980. That great city, because this is why. She made all nations, everywhere around the world, every church, almost everywhere, almost everywhere, because there is a remnant. She said, she made all nations drink of the wine, which is false doctrine, of the wrath, which is coming. Just ask Kenya right now. You've got lots of stuff going on in Kenya that I'm aware of that is the church literally trying to f attack the truth of God, okay? So they're drinking the wine of the wrath, which is going to get worse, of her fornication. Now, this fornication is specifically the mingling of the churches and the states, okay? So that's happening. It's going on all over the world. You can just ask the Pope. He'll tell you, oh, yeah, I've got the whole nations, all of them, you know, right under my finger with this whole concept of my false teaching of the global crises that are everywhere, whether it be pharmacia, whether it be nature, whether it be weather, whether it be food, all that stuff. It's, it's, it's false, and it's causing a lot of trouble. It's actually a man-made trouble that's being brought upon the world, and we're seeing it starting yesterday, actually. So the third angel followed them, the third angel, there's now the third, there's three angels, remember, and this is the third one, saying with a megaphone, megaphone, if any man, any man, that's you, that's me, that's women as well, that's, that's just a general man phrase, it's not uh, sp male specific. If any man worship, that is being obedient to and honoring above all other things, if any man worship the beast and his image, which, by the way, is personating the father and his image, okay, now, we learned about this before, and I'm going to do it a little bit differently here because of the wording, but the dragon, the beast, and the image are personating the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? So if you are a follower of the dragon and the beast, you have the spirit of the dragon, the beast, dragon and the beast, making an image to the beast. You see how that works? If you worship the Father, or rather the dragon and the beast, you will be making an image to the dragon and the beast. It's actually called the image of the beast because the beast is just like the dragon. And it's the same way with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. If you worship the Father and the Son, you have made an image, or you are making an image to the Son, which is just like the Father. Okay, so it's the same exact thing. It's, it's Revelation 12 and 13 are, is, like a hyper-focus of the false gospel in the world. Okay. So really, the, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, it's all a commingling, or not a commingling, but it's, it's a mingling of the truth and error. And what's happening is we're calling people away from that darkness. And so if you worship the beast in his image, you will be 
not worshiping the Father and his image. You see how that works? I'm going to change it up just a little bit because chapter 12 and 13 do it a little bit differently here than Revelation 14. It's still the same thing. It's just a little bit, uh, it's one little switch in your head. Anyways, you have, if any man worship the beast and his image, or let's say Jesus Christ and those that follow him, I'll say it that way, then you will not be worshiping Jesus Christ as one that follows him if you worship the beast in his image because we, we have a personation of Jesus and a personation of Jesus's character and you will receive you will there's no way around it you will receive the mark of the beast in your forehead which of course the mark is symbolic the forehead is symbolic or in his hand which also is symbolic so the mark is the how would you say the um Hmm. The activity showing their authority, okay, which in this case will be worship demanded on the beast's day. You see, because you have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. You have the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost. You have the dragon and the beast making up laws. And you have the father and the son making up laws. If you follow the laws of the dragon and the beast, you will receive their mark. If you follow the laws of the Father and the Son, you will receive their mark. It's really, really that easy. But it's going to be very, very difficult too because you're not going to have any food. You're not going to have any way to get fuel. You're not going to be able to have lights and heat and all that other stuff. Pray that your flight is not in the winter, friends. It's going to be difficult. So what you have is this situation being described here in the three angels, the third angel specifically, that you're going to have a real tough time in this world if you don't worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in your forehead or in your hand. But God has proven to us all through the history of the children of Israel, through his, the history of his son, through the history of the prophets, that even like Elijah, when he was out in the wilderness for 1260 days, for 42 months or a time, times and a half a time, you have Elijah out in the wilderness. And what was he doing? He was being fed by God miraculously by ravens. Now you can say that that is Islamic. And, and okay, I'm, I'm all right with that, like the early church believed. But I would be just as happy if God sent birds, like actual physical birds. By the way, they were unclean birds. Just interesting. But what you have here is this thought that God's going to take care of you. Like your water and your bread will be sure. And for me, it's going to have to be gluten-free bread because, you know, I'm, I'm allergic to wheat, right? So whatever, God's going to take care of us. Or he'll just heal me and I can eat what everybody else is eating. Or just like nobody will be allergic to what God gives us. That's just because it's manna, right? I don't know. But the whole point is God will take care of you. There's a song that goes like that, right? We got we to sing it, but we won't. Anyways, don't receive his mark in your forehead or your hand, okay? Now, what's interesting is something I've highlighted here a while back. You have God, you have Jesus Christ, and those that minister the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, you have the Son personated, which is, of course, given power by the dragon, which is the Father, and you have their spirit. Okay, that's the idea that's here. Same thing. Now these, or rather the same shall drink, whoever worships the beast in his image, the same shall drink of the wine, which is the um, wrath, the wine of the wrath of God. This is the doctrine of wrath. Okay, so yes, God actually has wrath. And you will drink of that teaching, that doctrine of wrath, the wrath of God, which Jesus would have drank for you but you didn't want to partake of his character, and so you will have to drink the wrath yourself. It's poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Okay, without the mixture of mercy, there it is pure indignation. And he, the one that worships the beast in his image, shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels. By the way, the holy is actually a word there, and this word can be translated or understood as spirit. It's not here, it's, it's a messenger. But if you go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, the angels are made spirits. So really, you can interchange the word spirit with angels. So really, it's the presence of the holy spirits. That does not make the holy angels the holy spirit. But they are filled with the holy spirit, right? So is God. So is the, the lamb. And so you're mix, uh, you are now a partaker of the unmixed indignation of God, tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, if you worship the beast in his image. 
Well, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, the rest that they would have is contrary to the rest that God's people would have, because if you partake of the seal of God and you're blessed by him instead of partaking of his wrath, then you will receive rest. You can read about it in Hebrews chapter 4. The rest still remains for the people of God. And that is, by the way, the Sabbathismos. It's the rest on the Sabbath or the seventh day. But these people who actually worship the Lamb, they have no rest. And the smoke of their torment, they're alive being tormented. That's even before they're destroyed. Because like I went through this uh, verse in the series on the three angels, I actually shared that I believe these people are living. And it's not that they have been destroyed yet. The smoke of their torment is kind of like the savor of our incense type life that uh, ascends as a sweet savor to God. Well, you know, anybody who doesn't have that is a smoke in the nose of the Father, according to Isaiah. So the smoke of their torment, they don't have peace that passes understanding. They have torment, and it ascends forever and ever. We will always know what it was like to live in sin on, you know, throughout the ceaseless ages. And they have no rest day or night. Who worship? They're not dead. They're not burning. They're not being tormented necessarily in the flames that God has talked about earlier. They are worshiping the beast in his image and who has so ever received the mark of his name, which, by the way, is his character. So the commandments, the mark, the lifestyle, the government of his character, that's what they are doing in worship of the beast and his image. And they don't have the kind of peace that passes understanding. They have torment. They have no rest like the children of God who actually have the ability to rest every seventh day. They don't. Day or night, they cannot find that rest. And so these people are very contrary to God's people. But here is the patience of the saints. They are the ones that actually keep the commandments of God, including the Seventh-day Sabbath, which is you know where you find three things that you can find in the Sabbath commandment. And that's what you have. Title, territory, I don't remember. And um, so anyways, they keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Now notice that's the father and that's the son. Now God was mentioned in verse six, right? Fear God and give glory to him. How? It's through his son Jesus. That's why we have the faith of Jesus. And it's not the faith in Jesus. We took, we looked at this in one entire message. This phrase right here, faith of Jesus, that was the very last message we did on the 20 parts of the three angels. The faith of Jesus is powerful to understand, very potent. And I think God gave clarity in that message. Anyways, after that, after we know that there are those that have the commandments of God, and there are those that have the commandments of men, those that have the commandments of God, they have rest and peace. They have this peace that passes understanding. They have joy and love and temperance and faith and all the fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. But those, on the other hand, that worship the beast in his image, they are void of the Spirit of God. They don't have the mind that comes with keeping the commandments and surrendering yourself to the Father and his Son. They want to destroy and persecute and undermine those that want to follow God and keep the faith of Jesus. But, you know, see, that's this war that's being talked about. There's the dragon, the beast, and his, the false prophet that's warring against the Father, the Son, and the ministration of the Spirit. And you have this battle going on between truth and error. And really, that's what it's about. It's truth and error. It's what's being described in the book of Revelation. It's a war about worship. Are you going to worship the Father and his Son? Or are you going to worship, which is his image, or are you going to worship the beast in his image? What is your pleasure? And really, it's about your decisions. So now going on in the next few minutes, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from this point forward. So if you're in the Lord, which is the faith of Jesus, you're blessed. Yea, saith the Spirit. By the way, the Spirit is the one that speaks all things to the churches. You can read in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Jesus said, I have sent mine angel to testify unto you those things in the churches. So I believe this is the angel. It is a capital S, not because it refers to God's Holy Spirit, but because it is the word pneuma. If you triple click, it's just the word pneuma, and there is no capitalization in that word. And so they're capitalizing it because the translators think it's referring to God the Holy Spirit speaking, but it's not. I'm sure it's the angel that Jesus said he sent. 
Yea, saith the angel, the spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. But then I looked, and behold, so again, I looked, and then now you look. That's the same idea. I looked, and then behold, a white cloud. We know that clouds represent angels in the Bible. You can find that in the Psalms. 67, I think it is, chapter 67. And upon the cloud, one was like unto the Son of Man. Now, we know Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man many times in the Bible. That was Jesus speaking of himself in the grammatical third person. And so you have here the, this, this one sitting upon that cloud, which is like being carried by the angels just like he came. You can find that in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. So upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man. And he had on his head a golden crown. Now, it's interesting because chapter 19 says he had many crowns. But here it says he has a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Well, this sickle, what, what is a sickle for? Well, it's specifically for, it's, it's a gathering hook, especially for the harvesting, right? So everything's over. He's done. He's ready to come and harvest. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. That would be to Jesus. He says, thrust in your sickle and reap. Because the time is come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. That's what I want to be, friends. I want to be ripe. I want to be the harvest that's on this earth that is ripe for the Son of Man sitting on the cloud of heaven. Okay? I want to be ready in this group. Well, then he that sat on the cloud, what did he do? He thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, how did he do that? You know, I'm going to find... um, Let's see. Uh, I I looked at this earlier and I don't know if I can find it or not. Angels, harvest. Yeah, here it is. In Matthew 13, verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Okay, Jesus is interpreting chapter 13. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the what? Angels. Okay, so we're reading right now chapter 15 in the book of Revelation. And notice what it says. The angel in the temple cried to the Lord Jesus who was sitting on the cloud, thrust in your sickle, for the time has come for thee to reap. Okay, so it's thy sickle, your reaping. But how does Jesus do it? Jesus explained that he was able to reap through what? The reapers are the angels. Very interesting, isn't it? I just think it's fascinating how God and his son constantly use others to do their service. So he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle and the earth was reaped, right? Well, then we know, according to this section as well, that angels come. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire. By the way, angels have power over fire. Okay, that's what it says. Another angel which had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Oh, so there's two harvests here. Oh, yes, there is. The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So really what you have here it's almost like the Passover, if you will. You know, because the people alive on the earth, 144,000, they will be kept through the final seven last plagues. And when the harvest is reaped, Christ is illustrated as reaping the good harvest. And how does he do that? It's through his angels, according to himself, in Matthew chapter 13. But then you have another description here in Revelation chapter 14, where it's talking about the harvest that is not the good harvest, but the bad harvest. It's reaped by another angel, and it is taken and thrown into the winepress of the wrath of God. So now you have two harvests. One is the Lord's, one is the enemy's. And you can go through and find that God is constantly calling us to be in this group, which is the Lord's harvest. That's what I want to be. I want to be one of those that's reaped by the Lord for his kingdom. Not the one that's reaped for being thrown into the winepress of the wrath of God. No, I don't want that at all. I don't want that for my family or my friends or for you. I want us all to be saved. And that's the goal that I think we should all have, right? So it goes on. 
And it says the earth was thru- um, s- harvested, basically, and it was thrown into the winepress of the wrath of God. Now, it says the winepress was trodden, just like Jesus, was trodden without the city. Jesus was without the city. You can know that he died without the city. You can find that in the Gospels. And blood came up out of the winepress. Well, we know when Jesus was trodden or, you know, uh, basically crushed without the city, then blood came out from him as well. But here we're talking about the winepress of God. This is the winepress of the wrath of God. It was trodden without the city, and blood came up out of the wine press, even unto the horses' bridles. So, what the, the horses' bridles are like? I, I, okay, listen, I've been around horses all my life because my mother has been um, somebody who's had horses ever since I've been a child. Well, I know that a horse's bridle, you know, if they're just standing, it's probably about a meter and a half or so off the ground. Okay, so it's like four and a half or five feet off the ground you know, a full-size horse, generally. And so they had a lot of blood. Okay, so like without the city and blood was shed. Like Jesus, without the city and blood was shed. Well, he only had the blood of one human. Well, these people have the blood that actually fills up enough to the horse's bridles. All that blood will not take away their sin. But even a drop of Christ's blood, just that little bit, that was spilled in his death. And I know there was more than a drop. I get it. But just what was shed from his one body was enough to cleanse everyone who's willing to be forgiven of their sin. So you can spill your own blood if you want to, but it's not going to save you. If you partake of the blood that Christ has offered for you, well, really, it's the Lamb of God. So it's really the blood that God has offered for you. If you're willing to receive of that blood, you can be forgiven even today. Now, what God asks you to do is to read for yourself what the Bible teaches, turn from those things that are contrary to his will, and ask him to empower you to live for him from now unto eternity. And he will do that. He has the ability to make you live with and for him. And so the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came up out of the wine press, even to the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Now, a furlong believe it or not, is like a stadium, okay? The, the, a stade or certain measure of distance by implication, a stadium or race course. So there was 1,600 race courses or stadiums, okay? So that's how wide it was that the blood sh- was filling up, up to the horse's bridles because of all the death that were the, uh, of those that were choosing to worship the beast in his image rather than the father and his son. So we could really be like the multitude and go straight to the wrong place, or we can be like that remnant and fully surrender our lives to God 100% and end up where he wants us to be. So it's up to us. And today I want to choose again to commit myself and my family to reading the Bible every single day, to learning what God would have me to do so that I can believe and be a tool that he uses to help others to believe as well, and that I can be in that harvest, the one that is with the Lord, not the one that's with the enemy. So if you want that like I do, let's bow together and let's pray, asking God's blessings as we continue on. Our Lord of heaven, I ask that you please bless us, that we can know and understand what it is that you have in your mind. I pray that you please Help us to know the truth and understand what it is that you're saying so that we can be transformed into your likeness, prepared for the harvest that your son is illustrated doing here, rather than the angel that's reaping for the the destruction of your enemies. I pray that you would please continue to keep and guide us. Thank you for this. And we do trust that you, which have begun a good work in us, will perform it until the day of your son. May it be so. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.